At 2 p.m. on September 21st and 22nd, a room full of entertainment industry people and others will watch a star-studded cast perform an industry reading of a new musical called Runaway Home. Darren J. Butler and I co-wrote the first version of the show over a decade ago. It wasn't ready then, but it is now. Our reading cast members include Emmy, Grammy, Tony, and Golden Globe winning actors and singers, plus an Academy Awards nominee. Even our chorus ensemble members have major league credits. So how did this come to be? You're just about to find out. Today, my guest is none other than my Runaway Home co-collaborator, co-creator, Darren J. Butler. We're going to take you into the metamorphosis of this very special project of ours. Be sure and stick around because we're going to tell you exactly who is in our all-star cast. But for now, welcome to All Things Vocal, Darren Butler. Hey, Judy. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. Hey, tell them what we just found out just before we started the record button. Well, this morning I woke up to the Broadway World article hit this morning. So we're super excited and very, very grateful and honored to Broadway World for uh, doing an article on our reading that's so kind of them and kind of spread the word and let people know what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, let's go back. And uh, I want to start by (laughs) asking you to mention how the seeds of our collaboration got planted by my persistent sister, Becky Ferguson. Do you remember that? Right. Oh my gosh, that was that was that's a story right there. How long do we have? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so back in the day, early 2000s, uh, your your sister Becky, your niece Greta, actually Greta was doing theater with me in the Shoals area of North Alabama. She came over and did some stuff with me in, in Decatur, my hometown, where my studio theater was. And and Becky kept saying, "Hey, my sister is a vocal coach. You ought to get her to come in and do a workshop. It'll be great." And I heard her, right? And I wasn't against a workshop. That That's not true. But at the same time, we were, it was a crazy season. We had so much going on. Mm-hmm. And I didn't know where we were going to squeeze in 30 more minutes because I was already having, you know, parents and cast members be like, we got to slow down. There was too much happening. So, but Becky wore me down because <laughs> I love her. It. God, I love her. And thank God she did, Right. Because she said it can really change your cast and change your your talent pool and help them to find their best voices. And I heard all that and it all made sense to me. Now, what what she didn't do really was tell me who you were. Uh, I had no clue at all. And so we're going to talk about that synchronicity in a second. But I remember saying, OK, you just, if you'll just organize it all because I don't have a spare minute, then I'm good. So one Saturday morning. Judy, you come show up and we have a pretty decent sized room full of people that showed up for the workshop. Yeah. And uh, about 10 minutes in, I thought I'm an idiot because <laughs> in just that time of you working with them, it completely changed their vocal sound. I saw them standing up straighter. I, I heard crisper diction. I heard a voice quality in them that I had never heard. Uh, so that was that was pretty amazing. So I'm sitting there thinking, wow. And then I knew you were a songwriter, but I had not made the connection to One Way Ticket. <laughs> because what you didn't know at that time was that, you know, I never was a huge country music fan uh, growing up, uh, except for Dolly Parton. Uh, and I love some Kenny Rogers, but Dolly was one of my favorites. Absolute favorites. Always has been, always will be. And uh, there was this song that came out called One Way Ticket. <laughs> and, and and I loved it. And at the time that it came out, I had just started doing the miracle work over in Helen Keller's birthplace. And I had some of the cast traveling back and forth that loved Leanne Rhymes. And so we listened to the song over and over and over again. And I just, I fell in love with it. And it was, I guess in my mind, it was like a country crossover kind of song. I don't know, I uh, but I loved it, loved it. And uh, I didn't know you wrote it, right? I didn't know that. I wrote because, it with, yeah, Keith Hinton. And, that's right. Yeah. It was an auspicious beginning. I'm so glad. It's it's so funny how, uh, how how we when we look back, you and I look back, we see all these connecting points. Yeah, and it's, uh, it's just 
pretty wild. Well, backing up, wild. I want to talk about you. Tell me okay. how you started writing and about the monologues that you wrote that right. have ended up in Runaway Home before right. you and I even met. So I had gone to New York in the early 90s to see um, one of my good friends, Rob, Rob Lindsay Nassif, wrote a musical called Opal. And I had gone to New York to see his musical at the Lambs Theater, which it was just incredible. Um, and on the way home, on the flight, I these characters popped in my head. I, I don't I have no idea to this day what made me what made it happen. But, you know, I've heard this happen before, like J.K. Rowling talks about Harry Potter just popped in her head on a train ride. And that literally is what happened to me as well. And I think as writers, ideas pop in our head, right? Yeah, but, absolutely. We, we just have to be receptive when they're being given out. <laughs> ab absolutely. And so that flight was from LaGuardia to Atlanta, Atlanta to Huntsville. By the time I landed in Huntsville, I had a, I, I work in these little steno pads, like, like this one right here, right? Mm -hmm. And so I had pages of... Aaliyah, Piper, the preacher, Steve, Father Liam, and they had names and they had basic backstories already started because that's what I did on the flight, man, paper and pencil and off I went. Wow. Do you still have that pad? Uh, I do. I do somewhere. Yeah, I absolutely do. You know, if you remember back when we closed the first workshop show, I gave cast members copies of things where I had done the, the very first scribblings of their characters. I, I did all that for them. Um, but that's where it started. And then I, I didn't know where the story was going. I knew I had all these characters, but I didn't know how they all kind of weave together. And for me, part of my process is to, to find the unique voice of a character. <laughs> I do a monologue for them. Now, whether that monologue ends up being involved in anything, it doesn't matter. But I think a monologue, whether that character is talking to themselves or talking to another character, um, it gives you a chance to discover what their voice is. So I wrote Piper's kind of backstory of how she ran away. And then I wrote Aaliyah's backstory of how she ran away. And I did Steve and I did uh, Katie and some of the others. And there was this thing I saw one day in a writer's digest that I subscribed to that said, hey, we're looking for monologues. And I thought, oh, well, I've got some new monologues. So I just on a whim sent Piper and Aaliyah's monologue in. And I got this really nice email from Gerald Ratliff, who was editing that monologue book and, and said, hey, we never do this, but especially from one writer, but we want to use both of your monologues. And I was like, sure. And I think it was like 50 bucks, maybe a piece to use them. And I was just thrilled, right? Because they're already published. Um, what I didn't know until that book arrived was that that book was filled with monologues from classic playwrights as well who had been my mentors growing up in, in the world of writing. So I was overwhelmed and I was honored and I was very humbled that our show had its first beginnings um, in that monologue book. And, wow. and, and people still use those monologues today. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. So our first collaboration was when you handed me um, the, uh, some lyrics that, sh that were titled little girl lost. And right. I didn't know that I, you know, I wasn't into theater. That wasn't my right. jam. Right. You know? right. 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 And I said, you asked me and I said, well, I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know. And then you handed me those lyrics and you handed me the package that contained the book and the, um, uh, and the, uh, DVD, I think to rent. Yes. With those two, I was like in. <laughs> You're right, right, right. So, yeah. So it's so funny about that. We come back to Rob Nassif again, who wrote Opal. Mm -hmm. Rob wrote a, a show called Honky Tonk Highway, and he's always had a great, he's opera trained. He's just, he's a brilliant, beyond brilliant composer, lyricist, writer. Um, and he said to me one time, he said, Darren, the closest thing to Broadway music is country music because of really? the stories they tell. And I remember that conversation with him um, especially if he wrote Honky Tonk Highway. And uh, I always thought about that when I was writing the lyrics. And the lyrics to Little Girl Lost were the only lyrics I had written at that point. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of that workshop, I gave you that piece of paper, that typed thing of lyrics and said, here you go. Now, honestly, I didn't expect to hear back from you for weeks or whatever, but it was the following Tuesday. That was a Saturday <laughs> morning. 
It was the following Tuesday. I know that because I had my um, senior level acting class of, in my studio um, and they were there and you called and I put you on speaker and you sang Little Girl Lost. And I remember when I gave you the lyrics, you said, don't don't hum any tune you have in your head to me. You just, right, just right, go right. do it. What was so incredibly weird and the kids had already heard me kind of do the tune that I had in my head. Yeah. Our two matched <laughs> and you never heard what I said. So the kids had chills and they were like, did you sing That's that? To her? Like, no, I didn't sing that to her. She wouldn't let me. I said, but it was something. And I knew, I knew at that moment, the universe had lined us up to do this. I knew it. Me too. And so it went. And so after that, you would tell me what scene you wanted me to write for. You'd you know, right. give me some text. Uh, yes. Then sometimes you'd send me some lyrics to work with. Yes. And sometimes I'd rework them and sometimes they'd be just about done. And uh, uh, or I would, you know, start with the title or we just worked all kinds of ways. Uh, we did. And, Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, to to where I don't know where I you start and I end, you know, I, sometimes it's like, right, that's, right. that's true collaboration, but it is true anyway, collaboration. Right. I would call you. I remember, uh, because my office was in my friend Jennifer's, uh, house who does work for Dolly and she, uh, sings, sings with her, but she, uh, I, my, my vocal training office was there and I would stay sometimes into the wee hours working on these songs because they just, I couldn't, I couldn't put them down. And so I, I would call you at one or two in the morning <laughs> and, and hum you a tune, you know, from my little $200 Casio with the really cheesy drum track and, right. and, and get you to, you know, get, and get your reaction to them. And that's the way we wrote the first rendition, wasn't it? Yes. I'll never forget driving home from the Miracle Worker uh -huh. one night. And it was before we went to Connecticut to do the production with Mark Mazzarella. And we put the duet in of Can I Love Again? And I had written the lyrics that afternoon, sent them to you on the way home about 11 o'clock that night. You called me and had the, the duet. Um, and I, it was just, that was that was so much fun. I remember those days so oh, yeah. well. And yeah. I think that's been the fun part too of the new songs is yeah. kind of that. Of I, doing that you know, it's funny because until we, we'll get to that, but till we yeah. started back up, I really, it wasn't in my bones to want to get back. It, just, it, it was a no. lot of work. And yeah, I was like, absolutely. and then when we started the new, when it was time, yeah. this music, music just like poured through me. And yes. uh, I think the script poured through you and the and, and our collaboration with the songs and everything weird. Um, okay. So explain now what a workshop for the people that are not into theater all that much sure. that listen to all things vocal what is a workshop and right. talk about that first one we did in decatur the precious so <laughs> when, you, when you write a play or you write a musical you got to get it up on a you got to get it from an audience right so we didn't do an initial reading of this right we didn't for, ever do a reading before. except for just my students you know i had my students in my acting class we would sit there and we would read it and they would so i could hear it um, but at that point, uh, it wasn't ready. I mean, if, if we were going to do the show, I had a studio theater, I had a budget, so we were just going to do it, right? It wasn't like going out trying to find producers and investors or a theater to do it in. So I needed to hear the dialogue. So the first thing we did, we did some table reads of the script, even before you were involved uh, very much. And so I could, hear, I could hear the dialogue, you know? Yeah. And then I think you thought we had a year or a year and a half to write the music. And it wasn't, it was like the following September, right? <laughs> it was pretty quick. I remember that. And so I had a studio theater there uh, in Decatur, uh, Alabama. And we sat probably mm, 48 for dinner. We sat probably 85 or 86 for just regular chairs. So a small studio space, very much like the off-off Broadway houses in New York. And so it was easy to put the show up because you're not paying the cast. And uh, you, I, I was renting the space already. And so we just kind of had our basic expenses, but it gave us a chance to get audience feedback. And that's what you have to do. You got to get in front of an audience and see if what you've written, uh, mm -hmm. if it emotionally connects with your audience, does the story make sense? Um, How do you sit there? And I would sit there with a the script and I would, I would keep track of when they laughed, when they sniffled, when they cried, when they applauded, because you're, you're trying to find the, the beat and the rhythm of a show. 
Mm-hmm. Uh, that's tremendously important. We, we knew from the onset that three hours and like 15 minutes was way too long for a musical. Uh, we knew that, but people sat there and they didn't leave and they, and they loved it. But I knew, I knew it had to be cut down. And we, we put it up in the fall as a workshop. We took it down over the holidays. We put it back up uh, in the winter, early spring. And that's when Michael Howley came. Michael Howley was a professor at Alabama State University. He's a dramaturgist and he volunteered to drive up from Montgomery and to watch the show. And then he and I sat at Waffle House till two in the morning with his notes. And that's when, because I told him, I said, no, it's not right. He goes, no, it's not right yet. He said, you've got something really great. I remember that, that you don't have it focused on who your main character is. You're trying to make too many people the main character. So that's what a workshop does. It helps you to kind of figure out what's the strengths and what's the weaknesses. And then you go back to the drawing board. Yeah. And I was totally ignorant of all that because it's the first theater thing I've ever been involved right. with. Right, right, right. All I knew was what, that the response to every single thing we've ever done with it you know, all uh, the the Decatur show, the Bristol Connecticut show, show uh, was just, un- I mean, it wasn't just like polite applause. People right. were roaring, you right. know, people were crying. It was so emotionally compelling to the audiences. I'm like, okay, let's just go to Broadway. <laughs> but right. It, right. It, it wasn't, there's a, it's like people that come to Nashville writing songs, you know, it it's, there's a lot more involved to, real song mastery that's beyond anything you can find in a book um right but mentoring and experience with these kinds of things uh can help you and there is a formula for uh for success that doesn't mean that you're not writing something completely unique but it's right. sort of an expected um you know with songs if you get too weird with them nobody feels comfortable with them it doesn't hit emotionally because it's too disjointed and and there's a you know with poetry even with haikus there's a form so you went um we we didn't just think to ourselves okay it's not ready yet which i didn't really completely understand but we stopped we stopped we stopped for a long time and we lived life a little bit. What yes. did you do? Um, well, let's see. So I'd get um, married. Well, before I got married, uh, and right in there is Mark Mazzarella, which we got to talk about real quick, because I, our cast, we did an al- a demo album. Remember that? We cut yeah, that. We did. Very Nashville. On the songs. It was, huh? And it was really good. It was, it was a really good demo, good. right? And um, those little oh, crazy kids, they put that, album up on myspace and i was so angry with them because i was like why did you do that because it's not ready to go out there there's a process right and they were just so excited about it which it led us to mark right so mark mazzarella who's a high school theater teacher at um in bristol connecticut at a private catholic high school he was just surfing myspace one night and found the music just by well i'm not going to say accident because it's all a synchronicity he fell in love with it so i get this that's how he found it yeah. I was like, I get this email from this guy. I'm like, oh my gosh. And I was and at first I was like, see, this is what I didn't want to happen. I didn't want it to get out there like this. And then I talked to him and I thought, oh, you know what? These voices that keep my head, they keep saying it's not ready. Maybe if somebody else does it, they can figure out what I can't figure out. Right. Maybe they'll help me. And I'm looking at this guy who had a really successful program. He won an Emmy award for uh, some stuff he had done. I thought, you know, well, why not? Let him do it, right? What, what's it going to hurt, right? So I flew up to see it, and I was just so overwhelmed. Um, it was really great to see how somebody else did it that you and I didn't touch it at all. I mean, uh-huh. I didn't touch it at all. Mm-hmm. And it was neat to see that. And he had great insight into it. And he had full houses in this high school auditorium. And I did the talkbacks afterwards, and I saw how people that didn't know us, had zero connection to us, were so moved by the story. Because, you know, when your friends and family are coming to watch what you did, they're kind of- really trust the reaction, yeah. So that's when I thought, okay, yeah, we've got something. And I still knew it wasn't right. And it just hankered at me. And so Mark's like, well, let's, let's do a collaborative workshop. And that's when we went and did the summer with Mark, and we took- part of our cast and part of his cast and made the joint cast. Right. right? Mm -hmm. And we did another workshop of it. So at that point we're in like workshop number three or four. Mm -hmm. Um, 
that's when I put the brakes on after that, because we went on to write We the People after that. Right. We've got another if show, did, guys. If it was Aaliyah talking to me, if it was Piper, I don't know. But in my head, it said, just hold. It's not It's not right. And Stephen King talks about this, you know, in the book that he wrote about um, uh, trying to go back and change the assassination of JFK. He had that idea at very early in his career, but he was like, I'm not ready. I'm not ready to write it. And I think that's what it was. I wasn't ready. And I knew I wanted to go into grad school. And, and then um, we wrote We the People. That was successful. And then I got married. Uh, Frida and I got married in 2010. And Evie and Jack were uh, five and four. Then we had Hans and we had Coco. Uh, and I lived life. Yeah. And that's what I think the voices were telling me. <laughs> was wait because there's a whole lot of runaway home that needed me to live life and to mature in my writing. I went to Point Park University. I got my MFA in writing for stage and screen. I had some of the best professors you could possibly imagine. Um, and I had one guest professor who just took me through the ringer on runaway home. I mean, yeah. The ringer because she was a native New Yorker, right? Um, and but I left empowered and I thought, okay. And so I kept thinking, I'm gonna get back to it, gonna get back to it. But then I started teaching at a high school there in Florence, Alabama. Um, and then we came here to Orange Beach for me to teach, and I just, you know, I didn't know. And that's when uh I stopped teaching full time to write full time. And I started working on a reality show called Love and Fair Hope. And then when that show went down, I had this time before my next gig could pick up this past spring. And I just kind of had this very spiritual journey, um, as well as working through a thing called Lifebook. And it was about how you purpose your life and what your purpose is. And I knew my purpose was a writer. And I knew I was kind of self-sabotaging myself by all these other things that I was doing that didn't nurture that purpose, right? And I was like, it was between Christmas and New Year's this past year. And I was like, this is it. Nope, I'm I'm focusing on this. And the very first thing I thought of that I have to go back to and tidy up is Runaway Home. That's when I emailed you and said, we're doing this. 2023 is our year. Yeah. And we would, every once in a while through the years, we'd touch base on it. And I knew never, not one minute of any of those months or years did I ever give up on it. And you didn't either. Right. It just wasn't. I didn't. Yeah. But I did worry about what you said earlier about, I thought, oh my gosh, how, I, how can I save all these songs, all this work? And how can I ask this woman to write more music when she's already put so much into I've got it? got about 40 songs in it now, I'll tell I you. I know, right? And and I had a professor at Point Park who said, you know, the average musical has, you know, 10 to 20 extra songs that no one ever hears wow. because it's part of the process. The, the and, average album does, has more songs. Oh, than everyone exactly. And, and that's what she told me. She said, your collaborator is going to understand that from the work she's done, she's going to understand when you say that to her, mm -hmm. it's like the extra song is an album. And so I had the lyrics to mine and that's what we, we started with. Mm -hmm. was mine. Yeah. And I also, I think a, a thing with me about it was not that I wanted to be lazy and not do it, but I felt really good about the songs that yeah. I'd before, before. And I didn't know if I was up to it. But when I started on mine and, and, and I got your reaction after we got it right, I was like, okay, I'm back. I mean, yeah, I've been, right. what I, what I was doing all this time was, you know, uh, vocal, my vocal coaching work had really taken off and really focusing on healing voices and, and maximizing voices. And, and it was being ex extremely successful. And then I, I did a <clears throat> video thing on uh, the speaking voice and, uh, my husband and I actually did an album that we wrote yes. and produced. And uh, there was just a another co-writer on there named Sandra Kubinski. But most of the stuff uh, John and I did. And how weird that aren't from that album I did we did in the meantime, one of the songs ended up in The Expanse, which is a, a yes. TV show, uh, TV series. Uh, but the other one, another one is one that you've chosen for Runaway Home. And it's going to be on that. So right. I didn't know I was writing for Runaway Home, even on that album. I know, right? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, 
and it, that, it, you know, thing, podcast and, the way, you know, right? all kind of, like you say, living life and, and yeah. gaining more depth of even what we do understand. Cause I want, I don't want to get hard. You know, some people's vision kind of focuses in on a laser beam kind of thing as, as they age. And I think that might be a mistake. Yeah. I think we need to have room to spread our lenses out and pick up some things that are on the edges that we've never seen before. Agreed. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I went through that dry spell too, because in that time, 2009 or so, I guess, until we started back, um, I, I stopped listening to musicals because frankly, I, I got to the point that I was so accustomed with what I grew up with was you go to a musical, you love the music, you can't wait to buy the album or the cassette or the CD or whatever it was at the time. Mm -hmm. And I started going to these shows and I didn't, maybe there was two songs that I wanted to listen to. My playlist consisted of two, two three songs top. And I thought, what, what's going on? Is it just me? And other people were saying that too. And I just kind of lost faith. I guess, in musicals. And I was teaching at Florence Middle School and one of my students, Jackson Maynard, came in one day and he was so excited about this, this show called Dear Evan Hansen that I'd never heard of. Because mm -hmm. I really, I'd, oh, I'd yeah. cut it all. I'd cut musicals and Broadway just off because I was just like, I can't do it anymore. Um, and he was so excited. I finally, he wouldn't shut up. So I I was like, okay. I, and I heard waving through the window. Waving the through the window. Like, yeah, I started saying. I was, I that one. was like, wow, yeah. that's great. Yeah. And I thought, probably the only song I'm going to like on this album. And I was really cynical looking back and very jaded, I guess. And That's then why I never the, wanted to write for musicals because I felt the yeah. same way. Mm -hmm. Right. And so on the way home that day, I started listening to that album of Dear Evan Hansen. First song, anyone have a map? It was great. Second song, waving through the window. Great. And the songs kept going. And I finally pulled over on the side of the road to a little parking lot by a, a CVS, I think. And I sat there, there's 10 major songs in the show. And I listened to the whole album. And by the time I got to the end to words fail, I was a basket case crying. <laughs> and I thought, holy cow. And I, it, Dear Evan Hansen, so Stephen Levinson, Pasek and Paul, they reignited my love for the American musical. Yeah. Absolutely, hands down. And then I started listening to Hamilton and Lin-Manuel Miranda. Oh, yeah. Oh my gosh. And I was like, okay. So like you said, you're back. I felt like I'm back. I, I love it now. I love it again. And so I'm so thankful to all of them. And I'm so excited that we're going to get to be a, a little bit of part of this community uh, of these people that I have, um, I have such great respect for. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. So how did you come upon Emma Denson? <laughs> our, she's going to be our director guys. Oh, she was a, a very young, small. Just, she's a young, young, amazing. Yeah. Uh, woman uh, who has already had a, a ton of experience directing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So she was a very small person when I first came across. Okay. Yeah, Emma was in my uh, program indicator in my studio theater from the time she was little. Uh, just such a great young lady. And I am so proud of her um, for all that she's accomplished and, and what she's done in, in, in college and directing and now in working in New York. Um, she and I connected uh, sometime last fall when my daughter was starting her college audition stuff. And I kind of started following her like, oh, my gosh, look at what she's doing. And she's she's directing these readings. And I thought, oh, mm -hmm. wait a minute. So I saw a couple of videos of things she did. And I was like, this is it. And I've been asked this so many times. They're like, why are you not directing the reading? This is mm -hmm. what you do. You've been a director I ask you that. 30, yeah, you have for 30 plus years. And I was like, well, a couple of things. Number one, I want to sit back and I want to listen and I want to be thoroughly engaged in the overall big picture of the show. Yeah. Um, and I can't do that if I'm directing movement and all those things. I'll, I'll get lost. I'll get lost in the weeds. Um, I need the bigger picture because the bigger picture is really important for us in this project. So I'm kind of like a showrunner, I guess, in the TV world uh, for theater in this. Um, I need Emma's voice. Uh, our Aaliyah our, is 21 in the show. Um, this very much hits her generation. And I feel very strongly about having a female director and what insight that she can bring. Because at my age, 
and, and so forth, I, I don't want to miss something that's really important. Uh, our musical very much hits home for this generation. Okay. I think it does for all generations, don't get me wrong, but especially this one. And I'm just I want to I want to make Aaliyah's story. I want to empower people. Mm-hmm. And I think looking at what Emma has worked on and the body of work that she's already done, I know that she can run this room and just do a, a great job directing it. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm excited about the collaboration. Uh, so then the process continued. Uh, right. You finished and uh, the script radically changed right. it, and I you know wrote bunch of more music and we put it together. But like you say, we, the first people we had to please, I think was ourselves. Yes. And yeah. then we have to know if anybody else is going to like it. So we exactly it right. right. out to some targeted focus group people. Right. Right. Why, why was that important to you? I think it was brilliant, brilliant move, by the way. Um, I think when people are sitting there watching something that your friends and colleagues, they're more apt to tell you what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. When they read it on their own time and mm-hmm. you're separated by hundreds or thousands of miles and they're going to send you an email mm-hmm. um, and you really ask for their honest opinion, I think there's a safety net that allows them to really express how they feel yeah. uh, and give them time on their own time to read it, listen to it and really evaluate. Right. Uh, and uh, the feedback was tremendous. We we learned some really interesting things of what they zeroed in on. Uh, we made corrections. I mean, things, one of my professors, um, Elise Dehane, who is just, whew, she's been such a powerful person in my, my growth. Um, getting notes back from her like the days of grad school was just it was like christmas morning for me <laughs> and and to and to feel her her wisdom coming through and little things to fix and correct and all that it just it was like okay this is ready it gets almost like um i don't want to say i need her approval because she would probably cringe if i said that but her her wisdom that's it her wisdom just made me feel empowered that we had what we needed right. to get a step. So the next thing was to uh, enlist uh, Nancy Carson's eyeballs and ears, right? Yeah. Nancy Carson guys is one of the veteran, most veteran and well-respected talent agents in New York, right? Yes. yes. And she's been behind a ton of really big careers. So uh, you known her uh, for a long time uh, and she was 19, the one that told you that yeah. the play wasn't ready, but it was worth it, but it was worth right. getting ready. So you you got it to her and what was her reaction? So um, it was Memorial Day weekend and it was at that Monday. And so she was home of course, and, and she was kind of reading it and texting me at the same time. And uh, she just had some beautiful things to say. Um, and she gave me some great, some, some additional great insight into what's, what's going on in New York and Broadway right now and things to think about. And uh, that led us to Olivia Hardy, uh, who is in the Tony award-winning musical right now, Kimberly. Right now. Yeah. yeah. Kimberly and uh, she plays, I think Kimberly's best friend. And um, she said, I want to send you this self tip of this girl, Olivia Hardy. And oh my gosh, we just fell in love with her. Yep. She's, she's our Aaliyah. She absolutely is. Um, and, and so thankful. And then Ma- Max Bartos, who was in Sing Street, he's going to be playing the preacher. He's going to be brilliant in that role. Another one of Nancy's clients. So I'm I'm thrilled um, mm-hmm. because Nancy's been a part of my life professionally since 1990. Uh, when I did Annie, we brought in Danielle Finley to play Annie for us. Um, and Nancy's always been that person who uh, I could always count on for honesty. Because she's not going to tell you what you want to hear. I mean, she's going to be very honest, brutally honest. But that's what you want. That's what I respect, mm-hmm. and uh, that's really helped a lot. Because, you know, that's where that's why we're here today. But she, but she never gave up on me as far as encouraging me to do this. You know, just because I lived in Alabama didn't mean that I couldn't do this, right? So mm-hmm. here we are, friends. <laughs> And so let's talk about another uh, part of our uh, the piece of the puzzle here, and that is Todd Bartos, who's come on board and led our company and uh, and uh, created the LLC for the Runaway Home Development uh, Company that we have now. And right. 
we 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 you and Emma and I presented it to him, didn't we? Well, over Zoom. We did. We did. And so I met Todd last summer. I was uh, part of a trio of myself, Sean Palatroni, and Mark Mazzarella that wrote a musical called Out of the Blue that we were a semi-finalist for the O'Neill Musical Production Award. Um, and we did a reading in New York last summer where I learned just tons of great stuff about how to do this. And um, so we had dinner with Todd and his wife and family after one of the readings and we started talking and we struck up a friendship and just really, really connected. Um, they have dear friends in Lansing that are actually people that worked with me in, in North Alabama, the Faraces. Um, So it's just very small world, another synchronicity, right? And so over the past many months of last fall, we kept talking and talking and talking. And finally, it's like, let's do this. Let's pull the trigger on this. And let's make this happen. And boy, it's it's off we go, right? Right. Uh, so, you know, and, and in a weird, talk about weird uh, serendipitousness and uh, taking trauma and turn it into, wow, fertilizer kind of thing. <laughs> uh, his son, Max, that you just referred to, had a brain injury. He's totally recovered. Uh, and oh, he's yeah. an amazing singer and actor and had been has been off and on Broadway. But he knows what it is to experience that. Right. And I remember we, at dinner that night and, and Max telling us about that story. And I was like, my, I had chill bumps <laughs> because our son, Jack, had a TBI playing soccer uh, back in 2018. So I I was very much part of our lives and understanding his recovery and, and seeing how the preacher, the preacher didn't recover because he was deprived of oxygen for way too long. Um, and his injury was quite different than Max's or Jack's, but um, but just seeing that struggle. And, you know, I, I had chill bumps when Max told me, I thought, oh my gosh, the universe is speaking one more time. And, and just to be clear, I never saw these as just coincidences because, you know. Oh, it's too. Uh, yeah. You, yeah. No. Oprah calls them, I think, aha moments. I think Steve Jobs called them connecting the dots. But these synchronicities are powerful. They really are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay. So after that, then, you know, it, the catch 22 is all of a sudden we started getting these incredible actors saying yes. Yeah. Melissa Gilbert, for goodness yeah. gracious, good Lord have mercy. Melissa Gilbert and then Abigail Breslin all yes. of, and Michael Park. And it kept on going. So the good thing about that is, can you imagine this play in their voices? But the other, the, you know, the, the sort of catch 22 is, and they live in LA <laughs> or at least uh, couple, some of them do. So we have to fly them in and, and give, you know, uh, give them accommodations, which is adding to the budget here. And unlike Decatur, we don't own these New York venues. Uh, no. so we needed a serious investor and we set our intentions, you, me and Emma on September of this year. And that was like right around the corner. And so, again, the serendipitousness and the, the synergy and all that happened where I happened to mention it to a friend of, uh, actually a client of mine, uh, Jack Dell. And he's like, all of a sudden his, his interest has peaked. I just said it offhandedly. I'm, yeah, I'm working on, what are you doing? Oh, I'm working on this musical that we've been working on a long time. Well, and then, you know, it took a long time because any investment in the arts of any kind is always a gamble. And for Perfect. a serious businessman who and successful businessman who Jack is, uh, you know, why would he gamble on something like this? It's ridiculous. Right. And so he talked himself into supporting us. He right. liked us. He worked with Todd to to create a business model that was win-win for him and us and everyone. And he went all in and he is our sole benefactor. And I want just for a second to say hats off, Jack, without Absolutely. you, this September would not be happening. And so grateful. So grateful. Uh, so and then the next catch 22 is we can't tell anybody about who we have until this thing called LOIs, which for a while I was calling LLIs, but limited uh, or letter letters of intent, sorry, letters of limited. intent came in for everybody because that was uh, an equity requirement right before we went public with it, right? Right. Because the LOI says, hey, I, I want to do this and you can engage me in services and, and agree with Actors' Equity. 
and it gives permission to use their name uh, because that's it's professional courtesy, but it's also just it's just the procedures, right? Right. right. So a couple of days ago, the last one came the in. The last one right? came in, right? Right. And uh, Jerome Merle here. We have a cast, and so okay. Darren, I was gonna trade off with you. Do you have that? Those names? I'm gonna bring that up here yeah, so I can it. see it. Let's so, trade off and announce the cast, and okay. I want you to go first. Okay. Well, I've already said her name, but we could not be more excited um, to have Olivia Hardy, who is our lead for our Aaliyah. Uh, she's just gonna be a powerhouse. She is currently in the cast of the Tony Award-winning musical Kimberly Akimbo. Right. And we're going to just give a really, because of the length of this podcast, we're going to give a really short definition uh, or uh, uh, short uh, uh, summary, I right. guess, of the right. work of these these actors. But you, if you go to Runaway Home, the musical dot com, there's bios on everybody and pictures yes. and you'll go, oh, yeah, I know them. And yes. uh, so as we as we go, just know that Abigail right. Breslin is an Academy Awards nominee and uh, from from her role in Little Miss Sunshine. Uh, she was also in Signs and one of my favorites, Nims Island. And the list just goes on forever. Yep. And then uh, Melissa Gilbert. Mm. Uh, I, I don't know how the universe just spoke <laughs> to us here because I grew up watching Melissa, of course, in Little House on the Prairie. Um, she also has a connection to the Miracle Worker and Patty Duke, as I do, of course, from my work with Miracle Worker. So the universe is aligned and she has been, a, you know, she was the president of a Screen Actors Guild and she's just one of the most delightful human beings you'll ever want to meet. So we are thrilled to have her playing Mrs. D'Angelo. Uh, she's an Emmy winner, Golden Globe nominated actor, director, producer, New York Times bestselling author. Uh, former president of SAG-AFTRA and our little house in the prairie girl. Yeah. That's right. That's right. And a joy to work with. Oh my gosh. We're yes. already working on songs. Yes. Next is Michael Park, an Emmy and Grammy winner. He's a singer that, that won a Grammy for his part in Evan, uh, Dear Evan Hansen, right? And for the, those of you who've, see, who've seen the TV show Stranger Things, he played the a father in that. I think he got killed or something. Yeah, and he, he ran the newspaper, right? Okay, yeah. okay, gotcha. And, and of uh, course, part of Dear Evan Hansen, which is, right. I mean, without Dear Evan Hansen, we wouldn't even be sitting here today, yeah. just to be honest. Yeah. I mean- there you go. There's another synchronicity, right? There's synchronicity. So who's next? Uh, Matt Hayes. So Matt's another one of mine from Decatur. Yeah. Grew up in theater, went off to Auburn and then went off to LA and he has just been tearing it up in, in LA. Um, he's had guest uh, spots on Jane the Virgin. Uh, he's a multi-award winning filmmaker, podcaster, actor, and producer one of the finest human beings you'll ever meet. And so we're so thrilled to have him and playing Shorty. Yep. And King Orba, uh, he, boy, does he look the part. I just love his, hey, his oh exotic, God. rough looking, you know, and what's funny is we've been told he's one of the nicest people you'll ever meet, <laughs> but he's going to play our, our head thug. So <laughs> he's going to play Duke and he is a film and TV actor and director and composer and plays Zeke in DC Star Girl, among many other things. Right. Uh, then we have my buddy, uh, Max Bartos, theater, film, TV actor, music artist. He's got a, a great album out now. He's touring. Uh, he was in Sing Street, uh, Broadway before the pandemic. Boy, what a great guy. Just great. Keep your eye on this young man. He is going, we're going to see him accepting many awards down the road. And Ellis Gage is a theater actor, voiceover, and jazz artist. And we are really happy to have him playing a part of Steve. He's yeah. just, just perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and then uh, Cadence Baker. Uh, so Cadence was one of my students when I was taught at Florence. Um, and it was really kind of an interesting thing because in the conversations, uh, in talking about casting, there was someone on our team who said, you know, Cadence Baker, right? And I'm like, well, yeah. And of course, Cadence on American Idol in 2022. She was top 20. And they're like, man, she would be, her voice would be great for Piper. And I'm like, yeah, it would. So I uh -huh. reached out to Cadence and uh, we're so thrilled to have her there. You know, and everyone knows her as a singer, but I got, you know, I, I was one of the people who trained her acting wise. Um, when she was in high school, she was Peter for me and Peter and the Starcatcher. She was in the Music Man, um, Our Town, 
um, she's just tremendous. I mean, she's just a tremendous little actress. So we're um, I'm thrilled to have her playing Piper. Mm-hmm. And the very last one we cast re- just yeah. just recently was yeah. uh, and just we are so grateful to be a, to find her. We we would have cast her first, right? <laughs> Probably said, so, yeah. We knew her, but uh, her name is Allie Gallo, and she's an American model, movie, and TV actor. Uh, and we're thrilled to have her play the lead mean girl, little C. <laughs> little C. Oh, yeah. She's going to be great. She's just yeah. perfect. She's one of the nicest people you ever meet, too. She's she is. And, and then our ensemble. I mean, Judy, I kind of tasked you, and like the ensemble is yours. Just help me find <laughs> great voices because, you know, when you're you're building that vocal fold, that, that whole thing, You've got to, you want great actors, but you want great singers, right? So uh, Cassandra Kabinsky, who actually co-wrote Still Breathing with you, um, you can see her singing that, by the way, on uh, a YouTube video on uh, mm-hmm. the Bird Cafe from back in the day. Um, Albert Gersman, um, Danny Apple, and um, Freedom Bresner. Um, Bremner, F- Freedom Bremner. Bremner. Just, oh my gosh, this is a powerhouse of four people that are going to knock people's socks off. So um, I'm pretty sure that I saw Albert in Mamma Mia when I saw it on Broadway. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, and I worked with Danny last summer on Out of the Blue. She's just delightful. You can see her on her on on many things with her and her singing dog, uh, yeah. which is, she's hysterical. She's great. But what a they're they're fantastic people, and we are we are beyond blessed and yeah. grateful to have this team of actors, this talent to bring this show to life. And hats off to uh, JP and Kat uh, Rendy, who helped me find the, uh, Albert and Freedom. Right. So, yeah, because right. I, I, I know all the Nashville greats, but, you know, with our budget, we didn't want to fly anybody in. So I had to have some help with the with the New York folks. I knew we could find if I knew where they were. So, yeah, right. we need friends, don't we? Um, and also, I want to mention Sean Palatroni, our yes. music, uh, yes. our music director. Uh, he's also an Emmy Emmy winning uh, guy, and I'm loving the scores that are coming across to my songs and to our songs. And uh, so I look forward to what he's going to bring to the uh, show with the with the musicians that he's bringing and the uh, mastery that he he has to bring new stuff out of. Uh, you know, that I wouldn't have thought of. You know, right. that into the song. So I think it's going to be an incredible show. <laughs> It is. It is. And like I say, guys, again, go to runawayhomethemusical.com. And I will leave a link to that, of course. And uh, you can find out so much more and you can keep up with the, you know, we're, Darren and I are working on this every day. Every day there's something new that comes up about it. So we are feeling like a runaway tra- freight train until we get to September. And if you're listening to this after September, you'll find on that website, you know, what, what's becoming of it. <laughs> so, Darren, what are the next steps for Runaway Home that may have already uh, occurred by the time people hear this? But what are the next steps? Well, the next steps are, you know, the, the purpose of the reading is to put it in front of industry professionals, producers, directors, uh, showrunners, that kind of thing. The next step is that it gets launched to a commercial venue, off Broadway or Broadway. Uh, that's that's our goal, right? We want to see it fly and do those things. Um, there's also a limited TV series of Runaway Home that's not really a musical. Uh, it has music in it, but it's not really a musical. It's not like mm-hmm. Schmigadoon or anything like that. Um, but it's I've got five seasons, fifty episodes of a uh, of that ready to pitch and ready to go for mainly for like a streaming network. So um, there's go. a lot of things in this world of Runaway Home that you and I could be very busy for a very long time. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, we we may, I don't know, it could be it could go on forever. It, there's so much, right? Um, but we really hope, we hope that they're going to pick it up because it's, I don't know, the, the timing all feels right that this show speaks, you know, it's about Runaways, but it speaks to, everyone who is struggling in life with so many things. And I think people will go and find things in the characters in the music of the songs, uh, the story that will can be so it's so empowering. All of it is right. So um, I think it's, I think it's time to see runaway home fly. So what's next for Darren Butler? Uh, well, all of this, obviously, um, I am finishing work. I, I'm a story associate producer for buying Beverly Hills. So 
I finished that up this week. Uh, and then, um, we'll see if there's another reality show that I hop on to do some story producing. Um, you and I are going to collaborate on a, another new musical called Never Say Goodbye, an Americana musical that I'm excited about because it's uh, not it's not as dramatic as this one. It's it's more of a, it's a comedy. It's a dramedy. Uh, I think it's going to be a tremendous amount of fun. So stay so tuned on the website to find out more about that. So maybe in a year's time, we will have that uh, that show up and ready to go for a reading as well. That's yeah. what some credits behind their names. <laughs> yeah, maybe so. Right. That'd be great. Right. Cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I haven't even guys, I haven't even mentioned the, the awards that Darren has won. And uh, so you can find all that on uh, darrenjbutler.com and I'll leave a link to that as well. And so, uh, you know, uh, here we go down the road, you know, to, to this work and who, who knows what else. And I just, we're not done yet. And I think every day that we just show up and try to be excellent at whatever it is we're doing, we just follow the road and, and it goes places we never would have dreamed. That's correct. I think you've seen that too. So Darren, I'm so happy to be your partner in crime. Same here, friend. Same here. <laughs> All right. See you in New York. See you in New York. <laughs>